années, nous n'avons été plus libres que sous l'occupation allemande. We were never as free as under the German occupation. We had lost all our rights, and first of all, the right to speak. We were insulted every day and had to keep silent. But that is precisely why we were free. As the German poison seeped into our minds, as we were constantly watched, every gesture we made was a commitment. The French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre spent a lifetime defying conventional logic. The man who never felt so free as under German occupation would go on to challenge almost every assumption about the way we live in his search for the meaning of freedom. What struck me in Sartre, I would say the physical, nearly physiological sense of freedom. A sort of uh, freedom em embodied, uh, made body. He was, he was freedom. It was while in a German prisoner of war camp that Sartre, working in secret, first began to realize the potential of his ideas about personal freedom. He didn't know it at the time, but they would become the basis for the philosophy known as existentialism, which would transform the mental landscape of post-war Europe. Ideas so potent, they would turn Sartre himself into a cult figure, an entirely new kind of thinker who seemed to speak to the ordinary people. He spoke about freedom, he spoke about action, he spoke about despair, and he tried to tell everyone that, you know, you are in charge of your own life. Only you is in charge of that. You are allowed to build it the way you want, and it's, it will be your own work of art. It is not his fault if people like us, who were not philosophers, who were not thinkers, took him as prophet. But there was another bleaker, less optimistic side to Sartre and his ideas. The moment when you realize that your existence is not founded upon any past objective facts, that your existence consists of what you're going to make of it, there is something slightly horrifying, maybe, about, th about that recognition. I mean, it removes your excuses, it removes your alibis. This is a world in which we are not only condemned to be free, but in which freedom is the freedom to do anything at all. If freedom is as complete as he says, then one is faced with a valueless universe. And that, I think, is what his people, if one could put it like this, are always afraid of, because nothing is of value. And this is a very frightening thought. Such an uncompromising philosophy of freedom might seem impossible to live by, but that is exactly what Sartre tried to do throughout his long and controversial life. He refuses order, he refuses uh, family, he refuses children, he refuses being uh, faithful. Everything is a contrary and he's happy. Well, he's a real, I don't know, you should kill men like that, you should burn them. It was no accident that Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy reached a really wide public for the first time during the immediate aftermath of World War II. France was an exhausted country, ashamed of its past and fearful of the future. And Sartre's ideas brought a message of hope. Everybody realized that the old frameworks of values on which they'd depended, you know, perhaps for generations, were collapsing. And Sartre's idea was that this was actually a fantastic moral opportunity. Other people were wringing their hands and saying, nobody believes in Christianity anymore, nobody believes in the in the family and in the moral standards of our mothers and fathers and our grandparents. And Sartre's idea was that actually from a moral point of view that was brilliant because it meant that people were taking responsibility for their actions in new kind of ways. To be told, you are responsible for the period of history that you are living in. You have not only the right to choose, but the duty to choose. And if you are now surrounded 
by poverty, by war, by oppression, by cruelty. That is what you have chosen. And as an idea, this is like champagne. It's tremendously exciting, bubbly. Um, it, it gives you an exhilaration because it gives you tremendous power. What matters is what we choose the future to be. We can choose anything we want. You and I together are going to make the future. In the heady atmosphere of newly liberated Paris, Sartre's existentialist ideas found fertile ground, providing the jazz generation with a personal philosophy of freedom which expressed their instinctive rejection of the past. We were against everything that had a, a semblant d'ordre, that seemed a little for order, so we hated that. And as much as we could, we did all that was forbidden and prohibited. It was prohibited to dance, we danced. It was prohibited to hear jazz music, we heard jazz music. But Sartre himself had more personal reasons for wanting to leave the past behind. Born in 1905 into an upper middle class family, the death of his father and hatred of his stepfather drove the precocious child to reinvent himself as a character unconnected to the adults around him. He looked on the death of his father as a great liberation. Now, that's probably not the way he looked at it in the five or six years after losing his father, but he felt that he had never had this pressure of the man he ought to model himself on and that he had to find his own model to what he wanted to be. He needed to believe he was free to make himself into something different. Um, the ability to reinvent oneself, the ability to choose, um, became the most important thing that was his possession, and therefore in his philosophy, it became the most important thing that anyone else could possess. Another factor in the young Sartre's need to remake himself was his appearance. An infection had left him with an extreme squint, and when he lost his baby curls, he was horrified to discover himself ugly. The major turning point came when the golden curls were cut off and he came home and saw something rather different in the mirror and, much worse, found that other people were no longer reacting to him as they had before. He had lost that charm and from then on it was his brain that was golden. Sartre would go on to study at the prestigious École Normale Supérieure in Paris where he quickly developed a reputation as an unconventional bohemian figure. The student who came second to him in their final philosophy exams was the writer Simone de Beauvoir. Je pense qu'il était le plus sale, le plus habillé. Je crois qu'il était peut-être le plus laid. Mais je me rappelle l'avoir vu une fois avec un grand chapeau dans les couloirs de la Sorbonne, faisant la cour à je ne sais pas quelle étudiante, parce qu'il était toujours en train de faire la cour à tel ou tel jeune philosophe. Ça, c'était même seul, je ne sais plus comment il s'appelait. Enfin, Though Sartre always wanted to be a writer, he initially took a post as a school teacher. During his spare time, he developed a strong interest in phenomenology, a new branch of philosophy that offered a radical account of the workings of human consciousness. In 1933, he took a year off and went to Berlin to study under Edmund Husserl, the world's leader in that field. When Sartre returned to Paris, he felt he had found an entirely new way of seeing man's existence in the world. The big idea he got was that to be conscious of something is to relate to an item in the world rather than to relate to some inner representation of it within your head. What we think of as self-consciousness is actually our consciousness of the world. The idea that we have such a thing as a self, an inner character, an essential being that we truly are, that is a myth, according to Sartre. And his, the whole kind of moral impulse of his work is to try and get people to abandon the idea, to give up. So actually, in some ways, rather comforting, security blanket of an idea that there is some answer, some inner answer to the question who we are. Sartre's whole argument is that there is no predetermined character which makes you be who you are. Who you are is a function of what you do. 
such a loved cinema, especially thrillers and went most evenings. He was struck by the difference between the characters on the screen and the people on the streets outside the cinema. The people outside could do anything they liked because they were making it up as they went along. Unlike in the films he saw, there was no preordained script in real life. Inspired by Husserl and his cinema experience, Sartre began writing an essay on what he called the contingency of existence, the fact that we seem to be here by chance with no purpose in life. Simone de Beauvoir, who was now his lover, suggested he rewrite it as a thriller. The result was a novel published in 1939 which gave a name to existential angst, nausea. Here we all are, all of us, eating and drinking to preserve our precious existence. And there's nothing, nothing, absolutely no reason for existing. I remember my philosophy teachers uh, in French lycée, they were um, flabbergasted by Sartre, because generally, you know, philosophers talk about uh, the lamp on their table, you know. When I perceive the lamp on my table, what do I see? Now, here was Sartre saying, I am in a cafe, and I want to know what the essence of the waiter is. You know, that was very new. Cast in the form of a fictional diary in which the central character, Rocantin, discovers that existence is meaningless, Nausea was an entirely original piece of writing which immediately became widely read. It translated complicated philosophical ideas into familiar everyday images. At its heart was an encounter with a tree, during the course of which Rocantin comes face to face with what he calls the key to existence. Then all of a sudden, there it was, clear as day. Existence had lost the inoffensive aspect of an abstract category. It was the actual glue of things. This root was molded in existence. I realized that I'd found the key to existence, the key to my nausea, to my whole life. I'd experienced the absolute, the absolute or the absurd. In front of this great rugged paw, neither ignorance nor knowledge mattered. Le fait que la vie n'ait pas de sens, euh, justement, nous donne la possibilité de lui donner un sens. C'est justement parce qu'elle n'en a pas, écrit d'avance, euh, tout écrit d'avance, que, autrement dit qu'on est justifié par rien à l'avance. Il dit toujours nous sommes, euh, nous sommes contingents, nous sommes nés par hasard, notre existence, euh, existence n'obéit à aucune raison. C'est à nous de lui trouver des raisons, en quelque sorte, de lui donner un sens. When war broke out, Sartre was conscripted into the army and assigned to a meteorological unit, charting wind conditions to direct artillery fire. Operating well away from the front line, he found that he had a surprising amount of free time on his hands. Sartre didn't have a lot of guard duty, and he would send balloons up in the air, very, in my opinion, a very philosophical gesture, and wait to see which way they, they drifted. And he had uh, what he did not possess in unlimited quantities when he was a, a teacher, that is time. And there he could reflect on himself and also reflect on the world. In this somewhat unreal situation, Sartre thought and wrote intensively. He worked on a fictional trilogy, The Roads to Freedom, and began the major philosophical work of his life, Being and Nothingness. It was heavily influenced by the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who by a strange coincidence had worked as a meteorologist in the First World War. Peter and Keller went off to get hydrogen. It was their turn. I reread Heidegger's lecture, What is Metaphysics?, I spent the day staking out a position vis-à-vis -vis his. The philosophy I'm writing is personal. It plays a role in my life, protecting me against the melancholy gloom and sadness of war. Philosophy and life have really become one. When France fell, Sartre was captured and imprisoned. 
His year as a prisoner of war made him question for the first time the extreme individualism of his thinking. Euh, là, il fait l'expérience, enfin, qui est tout à fait étonnante, visiblement pour lui, d'une rencontre avec des gens qui sont jetés là, par la guerre, abandonnés dans un coin, enfin, dans un stalag, dans un camp de prisonniers, mais qui viennent de tout horizon. Là, il fait une expérience humaine qui est décisive, qui lui fait prendre conscience de la nécessité de, de, de raccorder, de faire un lien entre la, la liberté individuelle et le groupe, le social. When Sartre escaped from the prison camp and returned to occupied Paris, he was determined to take part in some kind of resistance. He would have liked to become a man of action. Instead, he threw himself into the most powerful subversive activity he could engage in, his writing. Il est rentré, c'était en mars 41. Et le changement, je ne reconnaissais pas. Il était d'une moralité. J'étais sérieux. Ça a changé après, heureusement. Mais je, il parle de morale. De, jamais je n'avais entendu parler de ça. Sartre worked simultaneously on a political play, the novels, and his philosophical writings. He wrote fast. His ideas had been well prepared during his imprisonment. His play, The Flies, a reworking of Greek myth and staged in 1942, was a thinly disguised attack on the collaborationist Vichy government for preaching guilt and submissiveness to the downcast French. Once freedom explodes in the human soul, God can do nothing against man. God can do nothing against this pillar of granite, against this irresistible column, man's freedom. In an explosion of work, Sartre completed being a nothingness in the next year. It was a brilliantly original synthesis of ideas from Heidegger, which became the core of existentialism. At its heart was the concept of authenticity, the idea that individuals can always choose their own actions, even in situations that appear to enslave them. On avait encore ce choix, même dans la situation la plus dramatique, euh, plus que dramatique, la plus tragique, il euh, y a toujours la possibilité de ou de baisser les bras, euh, ou de se laisser aller, ou au contraire de peut-être de mourir debout. Il y a toujours une part de choix, même face à l'inéluctable, dans la façon de mourir, par exemple. Sartre était, euh, enfin, était convaincu de ça. Mathieu was still firing when the roof fell on top of him. He dropped his rifle and fell. 15 minutes, he thought in a fury. I'd give anything just to hold on for 15 minutes. Christ, he said aloud. No one shall say we didn't hold out 15 minutes. He fired. He was cleansed. He was all powerful. He was free. Here is the news read by Richard Wessel. Paris has been liberated. A communique just received from General Koenig announces that it has been liberated by French forces of the interior. We didn't want to see the French, you see, because the French, they came by the south. We wanted to see the English and the Americans, and they came along the Seine, so we went Place de la Concorde. And it was wonderful, really wonderful, to see them, to see the tanks, and we hated tanks, and we hated guns, but to see them coming along the Seine and saying hello, only hello, you see, Hearing that uh, language that wasn't French anymore, it was beautiful. Everything was going to change. We were young, we were hopeful, we were hungry and ambitious. Geography wasn't the same, history wasn't the same, French wasn't the same, philosophy wasn't the same. The school had to be completely changed, it could be changed because we had learned our lesson. So Sartre became our chief. He didn't want to. He just wrote because he thought it was true. With the liberation came freedom of the press, and Sartre set about using it to build a new society. Sartre dit pas, il faut s'engager. Soyez engagés. Il dit, Vous êtes engagé, même quand vous ne le savez pas. Vous avez des positions sociales, vous ne la connaissez pas. Vous ne vous en rendez pas compte. Donc, 
sa morale à lui, c'était « prenez conscience de votre une situation ». He started a magazine called Les Temps Modernes, which he hoped would help to drive social change. It was formidably important, not only because of the number of people who contributed to it, and because Sartre was the director, though the woman who really got things together and read the articles was uh, Simone de Beauvoir. But here was a review that was going to take everything into account, politics, the life of ordinary people, literature, music, but the accent was on commitment. Sartre really was born out of um, three weeks. His fame was, I mean, really was made during three weeks of um, the month of September 1945, where he really appeared like the writer on the scene. He gave a conference uh, called Existentialism is a Humanism, he uh, published his um, novel, The Chemin de la Liberté, Roads to Freedom. He uh, gave out the first issue of his uh, monthly magazine, Les Temps Modernes. And, and then the, his play, Viclo, No Exit, was, had been you know, performed many, many, for many months then. Sartre's newfound status as France's most prominent writer was held by his very accessible lifestyle in and around the cafes and bars of Saint-Germain-de-Prés. Here was a new kind of very public intellectual, who even seemed to write his books in between sipping cups of coffee and chatting to friends. Au Flore, il y avait, elle existait toujours, il y a une salle au premier étage. Maintenant, il y a des gens qui viennent là, tranquillement. Mais enfin, ils viennent plutôt pour lire. Si vous venez un matin à 10 heures, vous, trouvez, vous apercevez euh, Sartre, le Castor, euh, Bost, euh, Scipion, qui chacun était à une table et écrivait, grattait, de temps en temps parlait entre eux, bien sûr, mais c'était une salle d'études comme de classe. The people around them, they all lived in the same hotel. It was like living in family, I mean, near one to the other, and not having, uh, not being in possession of things. He owned nothing, no flat, no car. He even threw away all his books one day. He was interviewed by people in cafes and so on. People would ask him, but what is existentialism? And he would say, existentialism? I do not know what that is. My philosophy is a philosophy of existence. And he comes from a very complicated uh, German tr I mean, philosophy, which is phenomenology. But I'm not going to explain to you right now, he said. So one of the things is that, you know, the kind of people press started to, to pull some elements from his very thick and dense works into the popular press by giving, you know, bits here and bits there. So basically, they started to build a whole thing out of existentialism. Sartre himself didn't exactly discourage the kind of fashionable image that was growing up around him. He wrote lyrics for the singer Juliet Greco and was often seen in the company of other glamorous women in a way that attracted media attention. I asked him one day, but if you weren't a teacher and a philosopher, what would you like? What would you have been, said a chanteur de charme. <laughs> but as well as being fascinated by Sartre's lifestyle, the media was also scandalized by his atheist ideas. The mainstream press attacked him continuously, accusing him of moral corruption and of spreading hopelessness among the young. Sartre tries to uh, rebuild the idea of freedom taken out of the Christian culture and um, to get rid of the power of God on uh, um, uh, human life. And um, so he comes to the conclusion that if God exists, man is not free, and if man is free, God does not exist. I am my liberty. You had scarcely created me when I stopped belonging to you. 
Nature jumped backwards. I was ageless and felt quite alone in the middle of your well-meaning world, like a man who's lost his shadow. There was nothing left in heaven, neither good nor evil, nor anyone to give me orders. For I am a man, and each man must find his own way. You can neither punish me nor reprimand me, and that's why I make you afraid. He says there is no God. Well, more than half the world is against him. That's how he's bad. That's how he's nasty. That's why he shouldn't be read. That's why he should be burnt. Then he says liberty is for everybody. Everybody's got right to liberty, got right to go everywhere, say everything, think everything, do everything, and they condemn him as they condemn Socrates. He didn't like being famous. It stopped him in what he wanted to do. When he was in his bureau with his paper, then it was all right. He gave rendezvous sometimes to people, but when he was stopped in the street uh, for autographs or somebody who said uh, hello, uh, he hated that. Forced to retreat from the cafes of the left bank by the attentions of the press, Sartre moved to live with his mother in the Rue Bonaparte. They lived quietly, often playing piano duets together, and Sartre was free to write, away from the prying eyes of the world. Sartre, from childhood onward, was someone who had suffered when he couldn't be in control of the image that other people formed of him. This, for him, was hell. This was hellish. This was acutely worrying. Um, the discomfort he felt whenever he thought about what other people were thinking when they were looking at him is fundamental to his existence and to all his writing. Such tells this story about someone, I think it's in a hotel corridor, with their eye to a keyhole, completely absorbed in what's going on in the bedroom behind. And then they hear a step on the stairs behind them and they suddenly become aware that they are a person looking at a bedroom scene behind a, a, a closed door, whereas before they were just looking at the scene. And he's instantly transformed from being something that's just concentrated on trying to hear to being a human um, performing a shameful act. And he feels shame. And the very existence of shame proves that we are always under the eyes of other people. If we can even feel shame, this means we know that other people are looking at us, thinking about us. We start thinking of ourselves as though we were an object. And so we construct an idea of ourselves as an item in someone else's world. And that's the point at which something like a self comes into being. The implication of this is that there is no way that people can, in the end, be comfortable with each other. It is always going to be impossible to think of yourself simultaneously as someone who is going around the world acting in it and being an agent and also to think of yourself as being an object that other people are observing. So there is always a conflict and there is no such thing as human relations that don't involve this kind of conflict and this is why the, um, at the end of We Clue, um, the hell is other people, because we can't get away from this terrible gaze of other people on us all the time. It's much, much more likely that you will hurt me. We claw, or no exit, with its unforgettable catchphrase, hell is other people, was Sartre's most popular play. Look into my eyes. What do you see? I can't 
can't see myself properly. But I can. The problem of personal freedom being threatened by other people was not simply theoretical to Sartre. He carried his ideas into his personal life. And Sartre was partly dependent on Simone de Beauvoir and partly independent. He had said to her in truly Kantian fashion, we shall have necessary, there is a necessary love between us, but we shall also have contingent relationships translated into ordinary English or French. This means, uh, you know, we have a deep eternal affection, but I can go around screwing as much as I want, and so can you. I'm not sure that it suited her quite as well as it suited him. Sartre was never sexually faithful to Simone de Beauvoir, or Castel as she was known. While maintaining a lifelong working partnership, each was free to have other lovers. He had many more relationships than she did, but Sartre's many mistresses found that they too had to accept his definition of freedom. I remember asking Sartre, how do you manage with all these women in your life? And he would say, well, I lie to them with his gesture of his arm. And I then said, uh, to all of them? Yes, to all of them. And even to Simone de Beauvoir? And he would say, especially to Simone de Beauvoir, surtout au castor. Simone's most long-term rival was Michel Vion. She met Sartre in 1946, and they were lovers until his death. Her time with him convinced her that there were flaws in his idea of freedom. Alors, la liberté, je l'ai conquise contre son idée de la liberté pour les hommes. C'est facile, il dit, vous comprenez, quand on dit les hommes, ça veut dire les hommes et les femmes. On sait bien que c'est pas vrai. It isn't true. Simone de Beauvoir's experience of this kind of relationship undoubtedly fed into her book, The Second Sex. It was published in 1949 and explored the effect on women of the post-war freeing up of sexual attitudes. La liberté est extrêmement angoissante. Tout est possible. Euh, Dieu est mort. La morale, disons traditionnelle en tous les cas, la morale bourgeoise a, a périclité. Euh, donc effectivement, il n'y a plus de, comment dirais-je, de garde-fous. People were moving about. They were anybody. Anything can occur. Anything can happen. I kept saying to myself in anguish, where shall I go? Where shall I go? Anything could happen. What was happening behind my back? Perhaps it would start behind me, and when I suddenly turned round, it would be too late. What I think he totally overlooks is that human beings actually are very like one another, and that therefore nearly all human beings, I would say all human beings, would prefer to eat scrambled egg rather than eat coal. And therefore, this is the kind of value that things in the world actually have. He will not admit that because he wants to insist that it's entirely a matter of my choice which of the two substances I prefer to eat. Now that is the exaggeration of freedom, but it's also the destruction of the values by which actually most of us live most of the time. Sartre convinced himself, though he didn't convince many other people, that this idea of a world of existentialists all making decisions for themselves would be a world of socialists who treat each other as equals. And it's hard to see, really, why it shouldn't be a world of egomaniacs who treat each other like dirt. How to accommodate individual freedom within a free society increasingly preoccupied Sartre. Having flirted with but never joined the Communist Party, he spent much of the 50s trying to reconcile the individualist philosophy of existentialism with the collective vision of Marxism. You find that between 1958 and 1968, this word liberty, which had been terrifically important, had been central to everything he thought and said and wrote, vanished completely from his writing. The reason it vanished is that he had become much less interested in the individual person, in me, in uh, the self, in one person's fight. The only 
freedom he believed in during those 10 years was the collective freedom which hadn't yet been achieved. The individual, he thought, would be free again once the whole of humanity was free. La liaison du peuple et des intellectuels qui existait au 19e siècle, pas toujours, mais qui a donné de très bons résultats, devrait être retrouvée aujourd'hui. Il y a 50 ans que le peuple et les intellectuels sont séparés. Il faut maintenant qu'ils ne fassent plus qu'un. Non pas pour que les intellectuels donnent des conseils au peuple, mais au contraire, pour que ces masses prennent une forme neuve. Et c'est pourquoi je vous dis, nous nous retrouverons certainement. In 1964, Sartre was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Horrified by the idea of being incorporated into the establishment, he immediately refused it. Puisque j'étais engagé, alors la société bourgeoise pouvait bien ne pas tenir compte de mes erreurs passées. Elle voyait là un aveu et elle me donnait le prix Goncourt, le prix Nobel. Elle vous pardonnait. Elle me pardonnait et elle considérait que j'avais droit au prix Nobel, ce qui me paraissait monstrueux. When students in Paris mounted a series of protests that escalated into the serious public disorder of May 68, Sartre was on hand to play a role in the rebellion that for a few days rocked the French state. And all the little um, boys and little girls, they came and said, uh, you are a big man, as you always have, so you help us, he said, uh, volontiers. I shall do that. How can I help? You come with us. We, you, uh, you write for us. We are sending uh, la cause du peuple, and uh, you could, um, you could, uh, you could sign it. You could sell it in the street. He had several trials for that because it was forbidden. <laughs> The violence with which the police responded to the street protests shocked France and convinced Sartre of the truth of his idea that conflict in human affairs was inevitable. But the May events also inspired him to renew his pursuit of freedom. He was now more convinced than ever that the main threat to individual freedom came from the state and he joined those calling for its overthrow. He was always very revolutionary, ahead of all the revolutionaries. You got to read its, uh, its total liberty, its total revolution all the time, revolution for, for everything. Et à partir de 68, lorsqu'il découvre, euh, lorsqu'il proclame que le Parti communiste français est un grand parti conservateur, euh, c'est une espèce de libération par rapport à cette espèce de terrorisme marxiste qui pesait sur lui et dont au fond il n'avait rien à foutre. Donc il évacue le marxisme en 68 et il rejoint sa vérité qui est celle d'une sorte de d'une sorte d'anarchisme, je dirais. Sartre, the man who had felt free in a German prisoner of war camp, now felt profoundly unfree in Charles de Gaulle's France of the 1960s. He started to lend his name to various militant far-left causes and even became the editor of the extremist newspaper La Cause du Peuple. He was arrested on several occasions, but always released without charge. As de Gaulle himself put it, one does not imprison Voltaire. I suppose the point is that freedom, as he had conceived it, had always been a fantasy. It had been a very useful fantasy, not only for him, but for France. Um, the public reaction to his ideas um, was an immediate demonstration that the individual idea could ignite a fervor and a useful fervor in a mass of people. But the longer he lived, the clearer it became that individual freedom did not exist. Chez Sartre, toujours cette idée de, de l'échec, quand même. Parce que justement, euh, la, la réussite signifierait la fin de la liberté, presque, paradoxalement. Euh, ça, fini, ça signifierait la fin de la liberté, puisque, euh, par exemple, la révolution qui s'installe, 
euh, ne veut plus reconnaître les nouveaux problèmes. Euh, elle est établie, elle est institutionnalisée, et elle euh, désigne comme traître à la Révolution tous ceux qui euh, osent encore lever le doigt pour dire « ça ne va pas » ou pour protester. Euh, donc d'où ce style chez Sartre, d'une certaine façon, d'une sorte de, de révolte perpétuelle. As Sartre's ideas became more extreme, even his supporters found it difficult to follow him. In the 70s, Sartre made himself the advocate of social violence, uh, which was in, uh, actually a, a counter violence to the violence of the government. Uh, and um, he went so far as to support the um, uh, terrorist attack on the Olympic uh, Games in Munich, you know, uh, with this argument that terrorism is the atomic bomb of the poor. The only weapon available to the Palestinians is terrorism. It's a terrible weapon, but the poor and the underdogs don't have any other weapon. Violence exists. It exists in regimes run by police who are themselves violent. People who are victims of such regimes can do no other than respond with violence. I see it as a valuable political gesture. Il était quelqu'un qui faisait l'histoire, et je crois que son ambition a été a été réellement celle-là. Donc c'est une Sartre, c'est une grande ambition politique. Une ambition politique ratée, peut-être une ambition politique qui a connu des, des des heures et des malheurs. Mais enfin, une ambition politique. On, je veux dire par là qu'on ne peut pas dire. You, I, I, I mean by that that you cannot say that there is on one side the philosophy and on the other side the politics. You cannot separate them. You cannot. Uh, and if you if you consider, for instance, that Sartre made only bullshit with politics, you cannot save the philosophy. You you cannot. Uh, you know there is not two Sartre. It is the same one. You know, a lot of times you will hear that Sartre is incoherent, Sartre has uh, betrayed himself, Sartre has been with the communists, without the communists, against the communists. I mean, that he misunderstood this, misunderstood that, he made mistakes on this and that. I mean, I don't think that is very important. It's an attitude. It's do not take anything for granted criticize it, attack, find your own way. Uh, he would say something wonderful. He would say, I think against myself. You have to think against everything which has been given to you by education. You have to criticize every single thing which is being given to you. Sartre spent his life testing the limits of traditional thinking. But at the heart of this philosophy is one deceptively simple question. If human beings are truly free to do anything they want, how are we to live our lives? Sartre never did find a convincing answer to this question, but he was never less than unflinchingly honest in the attempt. Il euh, va faire une critique permanente des valeurs pour euh, essayer de fonder euh, philosophiquement la valeur de la liberté. Et ça, je dirais que il n'y est pas véritablement arrivé. C'est-à-dire qu'il est arrivé en nous montrant par le chemin qu'il a fait que la liberté, ce n'est pas euh, un but, ce n'est pas non plus une, une, euh, comment dire, un, un, un moteur, quelque chose qui vous anime, c'est une action. L'important, ce n'est pas tant la liberté, c'est le chemin qu'on qu trace soi-même pour y tendre. Madame, Mademoiselle, Monsieur, bonsoir. Des dizaines de milliers de personnes ont rendu un dernier hommage à Jean-Paul Sartre. When Sartre was buried on the 19th of April 1980, over 50,000 people followed the coffin and millions watched on television. No philosopher had ever had a bigger following. When he died, somebody um, said, now that he died, we've lost a, a compass because we will not be able to say to ourselves when something important happens, what does 
so think about it, you know, which used to be the way we would behave. So basically, he would be an ethical compass. De cette habitude de se mêler de ce qui ne le regardait pas, cette façon de mettre son nez dans les affaires du monde, cette façon de ne pas laisser les puissants euh, en répit. Il y a quelque chose de, de très sympathique et de très noble dans cette attitude, euh, cette philosophie du non. He gave our generation a sense of freedom that um, directed our lives. We made choices that I think we can still identify with. I'm just aware that at the present time, the message of freedom that Sartre is delivering is uh, not accepted. As if the, this burden of freedom that he's uh, putting on everyone's shoulders uh, is too uh, weighty. And um, maybe uh, we are in a time uh, when people don't want to hear about freedom.